Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It is so great to be together today in the house of God. Uh, please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. You know, one of the things that's, that's so great is, is sensing the presence of God in the room. When you're lifting up your voice to Him, when you're worshiping, crying out to Him, there is just such a sweet presence that, that remains in that place. And did, I hope you felt that this morning, and, and I'm feeling it now. The Lord is here. He is changing hearts and lives. And one of the wonderful things that we get to celebrate here as we continue our study of the Sermon on the Mount is the, is the transfer from those who are formerly children of wrath into the children of promise, going from that realm of death into eternal life, the way that we were originally created to be. But through sin, we were separated from that communion with God. But thankfully, we have, we have been given the means by which we can call upon the Lord and be saved. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? So, so as we continue uh, our study of the Sermon on the Mount, we are going to get into the, the opening section here, the Beatitudes, they're called. And, and um, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, I introing this because we did, we did that the last time. So I encourage you to go back uh, several weeks and you can get the first part of this and then you can listen to it uh, to give you more background on... Um, what, how we're interpreting this, how we look at this, what it means for us now, and what it means for us in the future. And so at the end of Matthew 4, we see that Jesus has been baptized, he begins his public ministry, and he immediately starts going into the synagogues around and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, as Matthew puts it. So he starts, he starts with this language of the kingdom, and that there's good news to be found in his kingship. But it's confusing some of the people because he's starting, to, he's starting to preach with such authority that's different and distinct from any other teacher that would have gotten up on that Sabbath celebration, right? When they went to the synagogue, they would have been hearing, you know, you know please stand for the word of the Lord. And they would read the word of the Lord. And, you know, here's what we think it means. And when Jesus teaches... It's, here's what I mean. <laughs> That's essentially what he's saying. <clears throat> and so people are starting to pick up on this. Some people are starting to get angry. And some people are hearing this. And something is changing within them. And I know, I don't know about you, but I know for me, when the word of the Lord is preached, and, and certainly when I was younger, there was, there was a moment and many moments after where I could feel that change. The Holy Spirit just just shoots into your heart and you realize, whoa, wait a minute, this is truth. And the, and the truth is difficult to receive with our natural mind, with our understanding, with our way of thinking and our opinion on how life should be carried out. It is, it is basically the opposite <laughs> of everything we think should be good. God says, no, 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 it's actually this that is good, the most good. And it is only through these, this means that you can enter my kingdom. But thankfully, thankfully, I believe I'm, I'm preaching here to a room filled with people who are citizens of the kingdom. Amen? Amen? And for anyone watching online, I'm believing that you are citizens of the kingdom as well. And that's a wonderful thing because, because there is such blessing and protection to be found under the watch of our king. Isn't that wonderful? So, here's what Jesus does. He begins the Sermon on the Mount, and as he, as he um, is going around signaling his kingship, signaling his messiahship by healing those who are, uh, you know, those who are suffering from epilepsy and illnesses and, and all kinds of problems, they're being brought to Jesus. He is healing them. And there is a distinct power being displayed through him. 
as he's doing this, he's teaching. And so we come here to Matthew 5 and then the parallel passage of uh, Luke 6. We have the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus makes his way up to an elevated place and he sits down to teach just like any teacher would have done in that area. So when he sat down, everyone knew, okay, it's time to learn. <clears throat> and now here's, here's an interesting piece of language that, that Matthew uses. Um, so as Jesus is going, uh, look with me in, in Matthew 5, verse 1. Let's read the opening verse here. When Jesus saw the crowds that had begun to gather because his teaching started to um, start to gain influence with the people, the healings had drawn people to him out of curiosity, uh, whatever. They're now starting to see, wait a minute, I want to see what's going on with this Jesus guy. He went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. So they're sitting right in front, and everyone else is gathered tightly in behind all along the valley. And verse 2, he opened his mouth and began to teach them. Now this phrase is used several times throughout Scripture to signal something significant and important is about to be shared. You open your mouth and begin whatever. That's a signal that you should listen to these next points. You should listen to what comes next. For instance, in, uh, <clears throat> in Lamentations 3, 46 and 47, <clears throat> we see a, a cry, a cry from, um, from the prophet saying, all of Israel's enemies have opened their mouths against us. Panic and pitfall have befallen us. So here we have an Israelite in terror because the enemies have opened their mouths against them. They are threatening to overwhelm the children of Israel, and it's causing fear within their hearts. So that's significant, right? They're in a place now where, God, if you don't help us, we are through. Daniel 10, verse 16. And after Daniel's mouth was touched by the Lord, Daniel opened his mouth and began to tell how the vision he was given left him weak and speechless. So the Lord rocks him with a vision, and he opens his mouth and begins to share just how rocked he was by the touch of the Lord in that moment. Job 3, verse 1. Job opens his mouth and curses the day he was born. After losing so much, after seeing all this tragedy befall him, he opens his mouth and says, I wish I was never born. So we see examples here that this is a, an idiom. It's, a, it's a, a, a language device that they would have known to signal something important is to follow this opening of the mouth. And this is a fitting way for our great king to begin his great sermon. And so as we, as we start to cover the, the Beatitudes here, the, the first 12 verses, we see here that, um, first of all, we understand this, and here's our first blank, is that character comes before conduct in the kingdom of God. Character comes before conduct in the kingdom of God because our conduct flows out of the state of our heart. If you're in a place where you're close to God, if you're in a place where you're looking to Him for your vitality, for your, uh, for your energy, for your inspiration, when you're looking to Him, you're going to have actions that reflect that. Now, sadly, we all fall and fail. The influence of sin is great upon us. We are surrounded by an enemy who wants to see us go down in, in flames and bust apart and, and have collateral damage all around our lives. And that temptation is very real. But thankfully, God has given us his spirit to convict us when we are on the wrong path, get us back on the right path. Not only that, to guide us into all truth and to be our helper, to give us a warning when the darts have been fired and they're on their way so we can raise that shield of faith, right? And that's wonderful, wonderful. So, so here's how the Bible describes this, is, that, is the character, the importance of character being primary. In Matthew 12, 34, we cannot speak good. We, we will not speak in a way that honors God or from a place of true uh, 
uh, repentance and, and words before God when we are evil. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? If you're dealing with something, no matter how much you try, eventually that's going to come out. But that's not a bad thing. It's, it's just we need to know that, that we are emotional beings. God has given us that blessing, but our emotions can take us places that are destructive, unhealthy, and even terrible because we start to hold on to certain things. We dwell on an unholy emotion or take something that could be used to bring us closer to God, but instead we draw away from him. We retreat from him and in recede into the darkness, and then you become trapped in that terrible cycle, and it can lead you to places you never thought you'd be, with people you never thought you'd be with, and, and now you really need to cry out. But it doesn't have to be that way. But no matter how bad your life has gotten or even is at this moment, there is a way to find the blessing of God and be counted among his kingdom citizens. So, Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew 15, 38 this, this uh, thought is repeated, that the mouth speaks what is in the heart. So you see a pattern here, that you're going to talk out of what you're thinking of, what's, what's really on your mind and in your life is going to come out. You're going to have to deal with it. In Luke 6, in our parallel passage of the Sermon on the Mount, we see that the evil man has evil treasure, and he speaks from that which fills his heart. So who is filling our heart is what we need to investigate, is what we need to remember. Who is filling our heart? What are we prioritizing? What are we hungering and thirsting for? Our actions are evidence of what the mind and the heart are dwelling on and drawing from. You know, a great example is if you look at a well, right? You, you, you drop the bucket into the well, Whatever's in that well is what's going to fill that bucket. So make sure you're, you're drawing from the right well. Or you could get toxic liquid. And it's going to do anything but help you. So our actions are evidence of what our mind and heart are dwelling on. Again, in Luke 6, Jesus makes this point. And, and listen to this, because with, with Jesus, there's no middle ground. He makes it very clear. There's either A... Or B, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. No matter how much you fertilize the soil, a bad tree is going to continue to bear the fruit that resembles its nature. You cannot get figs from a pear tree, for instance. It can't happen. No matter how much you try to hybridize it, it'll never be fully one or fully the other. No matter how much, right? In science, you know, they, they try to they try to make these hybrids and they blend different plants together and things like that. And then you make a, a new kind of fruit, a new species, let's say, or whatever. But it'll never be fully that one or the other one. It becomes a blend of two things. But Jesus says, well, we can't be that. We, we are a good tree that bears good fruit or we're a bad tree that bears bad fruit. Yeah. Ephesians 2 verse 3, Paul talks about those who live in the passions of the flesh. So it's referring specifically to unbelievers here and being classified as children of wrath. When you live by the passions of the flesh, that's a signal that you are, are not a citizen of the kingdom because you're chasing after the passions of the flesh instead of the passion from the spirit. So that's a stark difference, right? And the passions of the flesh are what we know from the beginning, because, because we're born fallen and we have that propensity towards sin, we go after that which seems easiest to us. It makes the most sense until God reaches out and he makes himself known to us and we respond or reject. So Jesus explains this, that there are two classifications of people. And here in the opening 12 verses here of the Sermon on the Mount, we see an explanation of who are category A as distinct from category B. 
There are two classifications of people. There are the blessed and the cursed. And, and the, the way that the language is set up, it's either you're the most blessed and the most cursed. Right? So you're not mostly saved, but not totally saved. You're either going to heaven or you're not. You're either going to be dwelling with the king in eternity when you graduate and cross over from this side to that. You'll be with him forever and ever. Or he'll have to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Which, which breaks his heart to have to say that to any of us. Because he is a God who wants us in his kingdom. He wants a bustling kingdom that's, that has energy and it's moving and it's growing and it's growing and it's growing. And the, the population of hell is decreasing every single day. That's what he wants. Amen. I want a kingdom with six billion people in it. Amen. That's what he desires. Right? He doesn't just want America. He doesn't just want England. He doesn't just want... Um, Africa, he doesn't want, and you know, he doesn't just want all of that. He wants every human alive to realize that they need a savior. And he has sent that savior. And Jesus is signaling, I am he. So here is the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of my kingdom. But you have to be among the blessed. How many of you here are among the blessed today? Yes. Awesome. Praise God. <laughs> now, the, the word blessed here that's, that's used is, is in the Greek makarios, meaning happy or fortunate, blissful. So it has to do with an inward contentedness that is not affected by the outward circumstances of life. So at some level, you are content with God, you are content with, with where you are, no matter what is befalling you, no matter what you're working through, no matter uh, what kind of crisis you're going through, no matter what uh, has, has happened in your life that's negative, that's terrible, that you don't want to have to go through, or no matter how great life is at the moment, you are able to be content because you are among the blessed. But there's a difference there, right? Like we mentioned at the beginning, character goes before conduct. So there's a character of blessing. And even that sub-definition there, the, the blissful part, that speaks to being unaffected at the deepest level by what is happening. And that's a wonderful, wonderful blessing to have, isn't it? What a promise that we don't have to cry out uh, with despair like in Lamentations that we read, oh, the enemy has opened his mouth against me. I am in terror. We don't have to live in terror of what the enemy will do. In fact, try as he might, we are safe in the Savior's hands. Isn't that wonderful? That's the promise of our mighty living God. So being blessed is not a feeling or an emotion in this sense, but it's an overall state. It's an overall state. You can feel the deep emotions of life. You're going to go through uh, great mountains and low valleys, but it doesn't have to rock you to the point where your faith is shaken. It doesn't have to do that. Be and, and here's what can happen. If you're among the blessed, those who are the blessed, we rejoice where others would be despondent, where we can say, Lord... It looks dark all around me. The clouds are thick. There's lightning threatening me. But you know what? I am so thankful that I am in your hands. We can find ways to be thankful, and we need to find ways to thank God through where we are. I thank you, Lord, that in my time of loss and, and grief, whatever it is, that I have um, so many other brothers and sisters in my local congregation that can rally around me and lift me up when I feel like I can't take another step. And that's what can come from the blessed. But those who are not the blessed can rally around people as well, but the difference is they're not going to be rallying toward the central rallying point, which is Christ. There's going to be a much different uh, uh, outcome sought. It's going to be just getting over that, that emotion. But we, we don't need to just get over emotions. 
God made us as emotional beings, so it, it's not wrong to feel an emotion. It's not wrong to feel deeply. It's not wrong to cry. It's not wrong to, to laugh. It's not wrong to have any of those things, but we can do it without crossing over into sin. And that's the important part. And those who are among the blessed will be able to tell that uh, dividing line between those two. Even Jesus said, be angry, but don't sin. He, he got really angry at one point. And he, uh, he destroyed some property. <laughs> but thankfully, it, was, it, they, it were squatters that weren't supposed to be on his property. <laughs> right? There were people in the house of God. And Jesus said, oh, not in my house. I'm going to flip these tables over. You will no longer be able to do business and shame on you. You are not among the blessed. Wow. Those are heavy words though, right? Because he is a God of mercy and compassion and grace. His mercies are new every morning, yet he does not compromise holiness. And we would not want him to. Right? We don't need to compromise holy values in order to be a good person. Right? There's no 11th commandment that thou shalt be nice. Right? <laughs> That's not in there. He stopped at 10 for a reason, right? <laughs> but so, so what Jesus is doing here is he's speaking of those who have a new nature. Those who are uh, new creatures in him. And Paul makes this clear in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. For if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Isn't that wonderful? So we get to be remade from the inside out. We don't stop being human, which is actually a good thing. We, we be what we were created to be, which is human in all of its, all of its wonderful, wonderful parts and drawbacks. But we get to be called a son and daughter of the Most High God, a citizen in the kingdom of God. And that truly is good news, amen? And so what Jesus does here in the Beatitudes is he describes, um, he describes the, uh, it, it's a collection of values, you could say, that are undesirable by any worldly standard. So let's take a look. Here, what, what does Jesus say? Let's start in verse 3, Matthew 5, starting in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Or, or meek in, in other translations. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for my sake, for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he ends with this here. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, they were before you. Wow. So those who were blessed in the past had to go through these, these horrible things and had to live a lifestyle that was undesirable to many in the world. However, those are the very ones who get heaven, who get to graduate at the end. So... It's, it's easy. To, to be a blessed person, you have to be uh, poor in spirit, right? We have to beg, beg God to save us because we are wholly inadequate to do it on our own, so we have to come before him in repentance and faith. We don't get to do it ourselves. Uh, we have to mourn, but then the comfort comes. We have to be meek. Even when we have the ability to do something, we're called upon to be gentle, we have to hunger and thirst after righteousness, so we have to live in this hungry and thirsty state, but we will be satisfied. We have to be merciful. We have to be merciful. That's a tough one, right? We have to be pure in heart, not just good in heart. We have to be pure in heart. We have to be peacemakers. That's difficult. And we have to 
we, <laughs> we have to gladly go through persecution. Persecution and put up with people who falsely accuse us, who purposely make up lies about us for their own purposes. Isn't that wonderful? You get to be blessed. That's how you do it. What a great list. I love it. <laughs> but you know what? When you come to Jesus in repentance and faith, you become that new creation. You see the truth of those statements. And you see that there could never be any other way. Because Jesus modeled them first. And by his spirit, we gladly display all of these traits. Because we're given a new nature. We're a new person. Our desires are new. Our affections become new. Our direction is new. And there's everything great about that. And so here's what Jesus means when he, when he um, uh, very very uh, encouragingly gives a list of blessings before the commands later on in, in this sermon. In 2 Peter 1.4, we read that we, the blessed, are the partakers of the divine nature. We are, uh, so here's our next blank. Kingdom people share in the divine nature. So as we're continuing to define what is it to be blessed, Jesus gave a list of the outworkings of someone who is blessed, what does that mean? Well, we, first of all, we take part in the divine nature. Jesus' kingdom is spiritual. And in the future, this blessing, this blessedness will be fully realized in the physical realm as well because at the all, end of all things, Jesus is going to remake the world. He's going to restore it back to the original state of bliss and perfect creation. Right When the enemy is thrown once and for all, all of his demons, um, and sadly, a anyone who rejects Christ, they will be thrown into the lake of fire, and the influence of sin will be gone, and we will get our resurrected bodies, and we will live and reign with him forever and ever. So we are partakers of this divine nature. So Jesus' people are his in spirit and then in action. So it starts with the character before the conduct. And here's why I say that. Because God himself is described as being blessed. That's one of his traits. He is blessed. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 11, Paul talks about the glorious gospel of the blessed God, the blessed God. 1 Timothy 6 15, the blessed and only sovereign Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 31, God is he who is blessed forever. Romans 1, 25, the creator who is blessed forever, a descriptor of the creator. Romans 4, 7, blessed is the man whose sins the Lord forgives. And that's a quote from Psalm 32, uh, verses 1 and 2. Romans 4, 8, blessed is the man whose sins the Lord will not take into account because he has forgiven them. Again, another quote. So, so Paul understands the, the interlocking nature of, of the scriptures, new, Old Testament and New. It is by faith that we are justified. It is by faith that we become the blessed. It is by faith. What does that mean? It is believing in Christ for our salvation because we realize the strength of of this first statement, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So in the order of the Beatitudes, as I hinted at a moment ago, they move in a logical progression. They move in a logical progression. So each one of the Beatitudes uh, demands and leads to the others. For instance, those who are poor in spirit will be able to mourn properly and then receive the comfort. They will be meek that, that um, uh, even when they could show force, they will choose to be meek, <coughs> excuse me, and let the Lord fight for them, but they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, and so on. So the only way to understand truly the beatitude next is to understand the beatitude you're currently looking at. 
So what does it mean to be poor in spirit? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? So the, the word here that's used is patokoi in, in the Greek, and it's an adjective that, that means to cower or to bow down timidly. So it, it gives the image of someone who has nothing to their name, and they are forced to put out their hands and beg for whatever someone else who has something can give to them. So that's how we come to Christ, and that's how we need to come to Christ. Lord, I cannot do it, but I know that you can, and I need what you have. On my own, I could never do it. And this word is also used to describe Lazarus in Luke 16, 20, who had to beg because he had nothing. He was sick. He was on his way out, and he needed someone else to help him. In, in Luke 6, 20, we see uh, um, the parallel passage of this. It stops at the blessed are the poor, <coughs> excuse me, but, but the poor in spirit in Matthew is, is the more complete phrase. And it's most likely um, said a little bit differently in Luke because Jesus didn't just preach for 10 minutes, right? If you sat down, you, you know, you got your... Uh, you know, you got your pumpkin spice latte here. You open your Bible and you, <laughs> and you open up to Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and you read it. It probably would take you 9 or 10 minutes, right? How many of you know Jesus would not be able to stop after 10 minutes, right? He's a preacher. <laughs> he's a preacher. And all these people gathered to hear him teach. They're not even going to want 10 minutes, right? <laughs> but obviously we know he could say everything he needed to say in that time, but he took time instructing. That was his purpose. He wanted people to hear the gospel of the kingdom. Amen? Amen. So most likely what Luke did was just capture the, uh, the restatement, maybe at some point later in that sermon, where Jesus just, he just encapsulated it in a shorter set of words, where he just said, blessed are the poor, and then implied, because you already know what I said before, the fullness of that statement. It's not Poor meaning you have nothing in your bank account. How much money we have and how, many, how, how much uh, assets we have to our name has little and, in fact, nothing to do with whether or not we are blessed or cursed. <laughs> and that's important, too, because while, while God loves to bless us with every good thing, He loves to bless us with resources so that we can be a blessing to others, there's everything good about that. It, it, it is not a comment on whether we're saved or not. So if, you're, if you don't have a penny to your name, you could be more saved than someone who has $6 billion to their name. But the reverse is also true, right? You could be completely saved and be the, uh, look at your bank account and you have $6 billion in there. Or you could be someone without... Um, without a penny to their name, and you could be sadly des destined for hell at that point unless you turn to Christ. So Jesus is not talking about an economic state, and that's, that's why it's important to understand uh, what, what Luke is saying in that recording of the Sermon on the Mount. It's not the amount of money that is saving you or causing you to be blessed. But God is clear that those who are in tough positions, tough circumstances, dealing with, with uh, harrowing things, God is near to them, but they are not saved because of those things. That's important. It's only through Christ that we are saved. Nowhere does the Bible teach that being poor is good in and of itself. To be poor in spirit is to realize our dependence on God. That's what it comes down to. So this is someone who who knows we have no means of, of spiritual self-support, that it's only from him that we will be saved. And David exhibited this, this spirit uh, in, in uh, Psalm 86, verses 1 through 5. Uh, actually, yeah, let's just read it very quickly. Psalm 86, and then also in, in Psalm 51. 
But Psalm, Psalm 86, David's crying out, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am afflicted and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am a godly man. O you, my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all day long. Make glad the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. What is David doing here? He needs the Lord. And, and properly, he cries out to him. You, O oh Lord, can do this. You are the one who can make this happen. And then in Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. If David knew how to blot out his own transgressions, he didn't need to pray that prayer. But he realized, I cannot blot out my own transgressions. But here's what he's crying out to the Lord for. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only I have sinned and I've done what is evil in your sight. So skip down to verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Paul realized this in Romans 7, verse 18. In Philippians 3, 8, uh, Paul says, I count everything as loss compared to the worth of knowing Christ, to knowing our king. And thankfully, we have a king who took on human flesh, who took on our, our, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, our condition, walked faithfully, fulfilled the law completely so that we could be saved. He knows exactly what we go through on a day-to-day -day basis. He knows the temptations that are there. He knows the influence of sin. And still he says, if you rely on me, if you cling to me, you can be counted among the blessed. And here's why humility of spirit is first. Humility must precede everything else. If you think in any way that you could merit salvation, you're not going to mourn properly and receive that comfort. You're, you're not going to be meek when you need to be. You're not going to be gentle when you need to be. You're going to use your power when you think it's appropriate. You're not going to hunger and thirst after righteousness because, after all, you know, God, you did 70% of it, but, you know, but I got me part of the way there. <laughs> so humility must precede everything else. An unbowed heart cannot enter the kingdom. And this becomes very clear throughout the Sermon on the Mount and especially in chapter 7 when he gets to the point where he says, people will even see wonders worked in my name. They'll have prayed for people and seen healing. They'll have seen demonstrations of my power. But then when they stand before me and have to answer for their lives... I will say, I never knew you. Wow. But those who are the blessed can be completely assured that when we stand before him, he will know us completely and welcome us in. And genuine humility is produced by the Lord, but it is also commanded of us. So we have to live in humility as part of being born again, we now display that nature of humility, but we must continue to live in it because we can let it atrophy and we can take on a pride as we continue through life, as we, uh, you know, uh, let's say, untrain ourselves to lean on him and start leaning on our own understanding again. You stop living by the Spirit, and that's where you fall into massive error and massive problems, Right? And we've all gone through, gone through seasons like that where we can see the answer and we can see a solution that's quick and that's easy for us to do, but God may be calling us to go a different route, let's say the long route around the enemy, but we just want to barrel right through when we're not prepared and then we end up crashing and burning. So here's how Jesus puts it in Matthew 18, 3 and 4. He says, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
a child looks up at you with complete trust. When you tell them something, they believe it, right? Wow. God is not calling us to, to be dumb or to stop using our brains. In fact, that's counter. God gave us a mind to use to glorify him. But what we need to do is we need to realize the difference between uh, you know, creaturely wisdom and godly wisdom. And we need to seek after godly wisdom. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and that only comes first being humble. Because our natural state is the opposite of that. We are not humble by nature. We are not humble in a way that honors God by nature. James 4.10, humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And that's a quote from Proverbs 3.34. So how do we achieve this humility, this, this um, poverty of spirit? We have to start by turning our eyes off of ourselves and focusing them, fixing them on God. We have to starve the flesh by removing the things that it feeds on. And especially personally, there are certain areas that, that will be more of a temptation for others. You have to know what are your weak points and you have to set up guardrails to keep you on track. Bring people around you to hold you accountable. That's a wonderful thing, right? We're told in scripture to confess our sins to one another so that we can be encouraged with one another, that we can lift each other up, rally around each other, like I mentioned before, and, and, and lead holy lives because God cares about holiness. And a holiness that is only claimed but never seen is, is no holiness at all. If we have that true faith, it will be displayed. So you don't have to worry, all right? <laughs> For instance, when James said, faith without works is dead, he wasn't saying works save you. He was saying, if you're saved, you're gonna act like it. If you're among the blessed, it will be reflected in how you live your life. Yes, we'll fall and fail even many times, but overall, our life will reflect a pursuit of holiness. And then here is where we, where we start, the third point of, of how to get that humility. We have to ask God for it. Like David in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart. And what's the, the um, implication behind that statement is I know I don't have one, but you can get me one. You can make one for me. You are the one who can remake me, make me that new creation without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. And I get to put on the righteousness of Christ when I stand before the Father and he welcomes me in because I chose to identify with his son, the Savior. So how do we know when we're poor in spirit? And, and here's where we'll, where we'll end it. I'll run through these quickly. When the self becomes of no importance and Christ is of the utmost importance, Galatians 2, 20, Paul declares, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I've come to terms with the fact that I don't get to make the decisions, I'll leave them to Christ. <laughs> we will find ways to be grateful, no matter how bad our situation may become. And I know this is tough, but we, we need this, saints. We need to hear this. There's always a reason to give thanks, no matter what situation of life you're in, no matter how long you've been dealing with an affliction, we know that it's only for a moment that we feel this intense uh, heartache, pain, uh, whatever, severity. It's only for a moment. It's just a dot on, on the, um, the, the meter of eternity. It's just one mark on it. So bear faithfully through that now. And then when we graduate, it will be no more. Every tear will be wiped away. It will be replaced with joy when we see our Savior. So we will be quick to see the virtues of others and our own sins. 
We will be quick to see the virtues of others and our own sins. And thankfully, thankfully, because of our faith, we're, we're in a place of blessedness. So on the occasion that we sin, we come to him in forgiveness. He is giving that to us, right? We don't have to worry that every sin we commit is, is taking us instantly to hell. We're now removed from faith. No, no, no. It's, it's only, it, it's, it's those who are chasing after the Lord who can get up that seventh time, right? The righteous man may fall seven times, but he'll get up that seventh time because we're a new creature. We're in a new state. Our character is that of blessedness. And God knows we will fall and fail, but when we're clinging to him, his love covers that multitude of sins. So it's that wonderful promise from him. Prayer will become a regular part of our lives. If you know you can do nothing on your own to save yourself, you better believe you're going to cry out, right? I can't save myself. I need someone else to do it. Lord, save me. Lord, guide me. Lord, help me me. Those are the prayers he will hear and he will gladly hear. So we come to Christ on his terms and not our own. And here's the blessing here for those who are poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the poor in spirit, we present our broken hearts before the king of glory and we're given new hearts. We're able to live a humble life where we empty ourselves out before the Lord and we are filled with every good thing. The poor in spirit lay our crowns before the King of glory and he crowns us with righteousness and citizenship in his kingdom both now and forever. Hey, I'm Pastor Petey. And I'm Christina. Thanks for watching today. Let's stay connected. First, click the thumbs up on this video. Next, click subscribe. And lastly, click the Give Now link in the description to support the ministry so that we can continue reaching people all over the world. And if you're in the area, we'd like to personally invite you to join us right here in Middlefield, Connecticut and see for yourself what God is doing with our church family. Thanks again for watching.